Hello everybody and welcome to this video. This is an updated video to a video that I did about a year ago called Search the Movie where I went into every single parameter in Search and showed you how to do pretty much whatever you want with it. Because there's so much new stuff in Surge XT which came out recently, I decided it would be worth doing an updated version of that video. Surge XT, for anybody who may not be familiar or is just kind of trying to figure out what it is, is a free open source synth it's currently being developed by the Surge synth team. It does pretty much everything. It's got, you know, all the kind of uh, types of synthesis that you would want to see in a synthesizer. And uh, it also has a pretty crazy amount of effects that you can do pretty much anything, including mixing. And if you were sort of brave, you could probably even master with Surge, but we're not going to go into that today. Uh, just to show you um, I've just done a little snippet here. Um, I've just used the reverbs and EQs and stuff in Surge to kind of get a rough mix of stuff together, just to show you a couple of sounds together here. Yeah, Surge is very capable. You can do pretty much anything that you would want to do with it. Um, it can do way more than what I showed off there. But uh, yeah, let's basically start getting into it. So the purpose of this video, if you watch it the whole way through, is you're going to pretty much know what everything does in Surge. Um, you're not going to be confused by pretty much anything. And you will be able to make the sounds of your dreams and desires for free. So let's get into that. So like always with these longer form videos, I like to start at the top and work my way down and just kind of take it section by section. Uh, but before we start looking in too much into what everything is doing here, let's just have a quick talk about what the synth actually is, how it operates. So we've got these scenes here, scene A and scene B. A scene consists of your oscillators here. There are three oscillators in both scenes. You've got six all together. Uh, then you've got uh, various settings. I'm not going to go too much into these things uh, until later on because they'll they'll have their time. But you've got um, things for setting monophony and your pitch bend and stuff like that. FM routing, which is if you want FM between the oscillators, that would all be set up here. Filter configuration, which allows us to choose how the filters are working together. There are two filters in each scene, uh, which are down here. Then we have our scene output, which is basically our master mixer for the scene. Then we've got this this mixer down here, and uh, this mixer is mixing between our oscillators uh, within the scene, and also you know allows us to mute you know oscillators or solo oscillators, pan oscillators, and we also got these ring uh, modulation outputs as well. And uh, this is the output for our noise too. Again, I'll come back to this. Um, and uh, yeah, then we've got our filters and our main envelopes and stuff here. That is a scene. It's all this stuff. So if I change it to B here, all of that stuff changes. So let's make, you know, a couple of changes here so we can really see it change up. Let's change the wave shaper and it's probably going to make it sound awful, but you'll just be able to see when I change back to scene A. They're the same thing, but I can set them up differently. And then we can use them together in different ways. So I can have single, which will allow me to just use one of the scenes, if that's all I need. Then I can key split them. Uh, this will allow me to set one part of my keyboard to be one of the scenes, and then another part of my keyboard to be another scene. So you might want to have something chordal up in the higher register, and then something, maybe a bass sound or something in the lower register. That's how you'd set that up. And then you set where the split occurs here by the note. You can channel split it as well if that's something that you need to do. And you can also use it in dual mode. And dual mode will basically mix the two scenes together. So it's just one big sound, which is... If we listen to it here, let's make it more obvious. So let's uh, take this whole B part and pitch it way up. Turn it up a bit. So now you hear the lower part. And then B is the higher part, it's set to single. Then if I go to dual, they'll play together. 
So yeah, that's pretty much it for the scenes and how they work. Um, you can also set your polyphony here. So you can set your polyphony as low as two just by dragging down on this. And you can set it all the way up to 64. So you can play 64 notes at once. A good thing to note here as well is that if you're sort of interacting with anything, most of the time a double click will reset it to the default. So I can reset the mixer to what it's supposed to be here if I just double click. And I can also reset my polyphony to 16. So yeah, that's pretty much it for over here. Then we move into the patch browser and the patch browser has been greatly updated for Surge XT. Basically, this patch browser we had before was fairly archaic, but now it's uh, pretty fully featured. So uh, there's various things we can do. At the most basic form, we can use these navigation buttons down here to move through categories. So as you can see right now, we're in sequences. So we can hear the first patch in sequences. That's probably a bit low to play that sound. So if we're in sequences here, we can move to the next patch in sequences by just hitting this navigational button. So let's say that we don't want to hear things in sequences anymore. We can now move through the categories with these. So let's move to, let's not go to splits. Let's go to plucks. And then we can move through them, of course, the same way. And then, you know, if we made our own patch, we can save it down here too. And uh, that will give us an opportunity to name it. So if I was to say save this, I could call it something else like, you know, cool bell or whatever. And then I would save that and that would go into my, uh, my user part over here, which we'll have a look at in a second. Um, but yeah, that's the sort of main navigation down here. You can also search, which is a new thing that they've added. So let's say I wanted to have a super saw. So I've got JPXK or JPAK super saw here and click into that. And there I've got a super saw. Um, so you can search anything. And then um, so you can also search things like, you know, uh, pluck or bass or whatever and stuff like that will come up. So as you can see with this preset as well, um, I have it favored it. Uh, you can just hit this little heart to favorite things and uh, you can unfavorite them by clicking it again. Uh, the favorites will come up here in your favorites under user patches. So you can see if I add this JP8K Super Saw to my favorites, I come here to my favorites, it comes up in here. The other things to take note of is if I click on this window here that displays, you can see I can come in and browse the categories as I was before. And uh, also this third party patches in here by various cool people that have contributed their patches to Surge. And there's some great stuff in here, so it's worth checking out. Then in your user patches, um, you can see here I've got one called percussion. So you can create your own categories here. So when you make a patch, so I've made one here called layered kick, and I've put it into this percussion category. So it's just a really simple kick just to show that off. And then even if you make your own stuff, you could favorite it and it will, of course, come up in your favorites. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for the regular stuff in the in the patch browser. You can also initialize the patch from here. This will just give you the default patch for Surge. You can also set the current patch as default if you want to make some changes to the default patch. You can also save your patches from in here. So if you just hit save patch here, it will give you an opportunity to name it and put it into a category that suits it. And uh, you can change the author name to yourself and add any comments if you want to remember stuff about the patch. And then the other stuff in here is to do with sort of loading patches and stuff. So you can load patches from files. If you've got a file with a bunch of patches in it, you can bring it into Surge. Uh, you can refresh the patch browser if, you know, maybe something isn't showing up. And uh, yeah, just got stuff for opening sort of various patches that you may need. And that's pretty much it for the patch browser. So moving on, we can activate MPE here. Uh, this will allow Surge to uh, work with MPE controllers. If you have one of those, uh, you'll probably have to follow the guide on how to set that up with your individual MPE controller, but it does support MPE. Then next here, we've got this uh, tuning button. This will allow us to import tuning files if you want to use a non-standard tuning. If that's the sort of thing that you're doing, you probably don't need me to explain it to you, but basically you can load a file and it will change around the notes. Um, it's good for you know a lot of world music and stuff that's not necessarily done on a western scale there's also a really detailed tuning editor in here and there's a bunch of ways that you can sort of edit the tuning of individual notes so you can do 
you know, pretty much any sort of microtonal thing that you want to set up in here. Um, if you want a tutorial for this, you can let me know. But um, to be honest with you, if this is the sort of thing that you're into doing, you, you probably don't need me to sit here and explain it to you. You can pretty much do whatever you want with the tuning of the synth. Uh, then you've got zoom. So these are just presets for the zoom. You can drag out the synth to resize it, but uh, you can also set it to pre-designated zoom levels in here. Uh, some of them are probably a bit too large for the purposes of this video. So the next thing you've got here is you've got the effects bypass and character. So the character, it's sort of like an EQ for the overall synth. So you can make it brighter, you can have it normal. So you can hear the difference there, you can have it warmer. Just sort of a warmer sound. Uh, it's a nice little addition to have. Uh, then you can bypass certain things. So let's say I had this setup sent to a reverb send. So let's add a spring reverb in here. Let's put it on the send and let's just make it really big. So now we're sending to the spring reverb and I'm sending it 100% here with the send. I'll go into that in a while. Let's say that I wanted to bypass the send. Now I can click this send and now my send will be bypassed and that's globally. Uh, then we've got a, uh, a second one here, which is uh, global and send. So this will bypass these final effects here. So these go over both. These go over both the, so you can see here that A has its own effects and then B has its own effects. And then we have this global effect here. So if I add something to this global effect, let's add say Nimbus here. And then I move this global, that gets deactivated as well. And then finally we have all. So what that will affect is the individual effects on A and B. So let's say I had a flanger here on A. Then I go to all. And now every effect is bypassed. So we've got all the global bypassed, all the sends bypassed, and all the individual effects bypassed. Then we've got a master output here. This is just the overall output of the synth. There's also a display here which will show us roughly how the output is coming out. And that's pretty much it for this top section here. So next we have the oscillator section. Uh, this is probably going to be the section that takes the most time because there's quite a lot to go into here. Before we go into all the mental oscillator types and all the stuff that's going on in here, let's just have a quick look at the oscillator section. So we have three oscillators that we can select between. We've got one, two and three here. And selecting between them isn't going to change which one we're here and like it does up here. What we need to do is actually turn them on in the mixer. So I can mute one now and I'm going to hear nothing when I'm hitting the key because it's muted. And now I can turn on oscillator two. Let's put it up an octave. Now we're here in oscillator two. If I mute that and I go back to oscillator one. We can mix them together if both of them are unmuted. And then we have a volume for each one. We can also pan them. So we can send one of them left and one of them right. Maybe if we set both of them to the same pitch and we slightly detuned them, we get sort of a super saw sound. Probably a bit too detuned, but you get the idea. And uh, yeah, so that is uh, that is how the, the mixer interacts with the oscillators. Let's initialize the patch here. So uh, the other thing about the oscillators is we've gone into it, but you can also uh, change the octave here. So that's minus three octaves to plus three octaves, and you can set it to zero. The other thing we've got here is key track. Uh, key track, when it's turned, it will be turned on by default, but if we turn it off, no matter what key I hit on my keyboard, I'm hitting them all right now. It's gonna be the same pitch, so we're designating a specific pitch. Um, this can be very useful for uh, percussion sounds, FM sounds, there's lots of contexts you may not want one or all of the oscillators to track pitch for, so that's worth knowing. Retrigger is gonna retrigger the oscillator at the start of its cycle every time, so basically, normally when the oscillator is running, it just basically is running freely, and when we hit a note, it doesn't reset the oscillator, so it may come in here, it may come in here on the waveform, it may come in here, and this has the effect of every note sort of sounding a little bit different, and uh, if we're stacking things on top of each other, uh, they're all going to be in different phases. So if you don't want that to happen and you wanted to restart right here every time, uh, there are sounds you'd want that for. Again, percussion, um, basses, a lot of the time you want them to have a really solid, consistent sound. So you may want those to constantly re-trigger on the same thing. And uh, yeah, so, so that's what re-trigger does. 
And uh, then we have various controls down here. So we've got pitch, fairly self-explanatory. This allows us to go up or down in semitones to a maximum of seven and minus seven. Uh, if that is not enough for you, you can right click on here and you can go to extend range. St extend range is gonna make it so that we can go to minus 84 semitones and plus 84 semitones. There's a couple of more options in here that are worth looking at. We've got absolute pitch here as well. This will allow us to set the pitch of the oscillator in hertz. So if we turn off our key tracking, we could have an oscillator that's set to, you know, basically LFO rate down here. Or we can set it up 840 hertz. Um, again, this can be very useful um, when you're working with, you know, oscillators modulating each other and stuff. Uh, it can be very useful to be able to change the pitch in hertz. Uh, you can add modulation from a source. This is not the most effective way to add modulation, but if you'd like to do it this way, you can. So we could add modulation from macro one here, and then we can set the amount of hertz we want to we want to do it. So let's do it by 840. And then you can see here my macro is now going to be attached to my pitch. So let's just reset this patch. Then we've got the shape. So uh, each oscillator here, let's start getting into the oscillator selection. So we've got classic and modern. Classic is the old default oscillator. So it's got sawtooth and square wave. Um, and it sounds a little bit different to modern, but modern is sort of the same idea. So if we go to classic here first, which is what we're on, we can change the shape. And it morphs from a square to a saw to like a saw an octave up. Then if we're in the square uh, the square mode here, we've got a width control. So we can do um, uh, pulse width modulation. We can also do a different type of pulse width modulation here. Or we can do both at the same time. Now, uh, if you're in a saw wave here, so let's set it to a saw wave. This first pulse width modulation isn't gonna work at all. It's not gonna do anything. And neither will the second one. But if you're on this sort of upper shape here, this octave up saw, this will allow you to do pulse width modulation. So you can get some really cool sounds doing that. Uh, especially with the saws, if you have two saws set up and you pan them against each other and you mess around with these controls, you can get some really cool sounds with that. Uh, then we've got modern. Um, modern is very similar. By the way, when I hit when I hit uh, in classic here, if I hit sawtooth or square wave, all it's doing is changing uh, where in the slider the shape is. So it's not actually a different oscillator. It's just basically a preset for the oscillator. So you can see it just changes the shape here. Then modern, if I click sawtooth, what we have here is a mixer. So uh, we can have everything at zero. Let's bring them back to all zero. Then we get silence. We could add a pulse width in, which is basically a square wave. And I'm double clicking here to reset them. Bring in a triangle wave. And then we can also, um, we can mix them together, obviously. So it could have a bit of triangle, a bit of saw, and a bit of square. Maybe bring in more triangle. So you get a lot more range in what you can do here. And of course, you have your pulse width again here. And you also have sync. Which will allow you to do that whole sync thing. So let's bring in just our sawtooth there. And get that typical sawtooth sync sound. And uh, yeah, that's also available here in Classic. That's the only real difference between them. Uh, in Classic, you can also bring in a sub. And the sub is basically going to be a square wave an octave down. So you can mix that in. You could have 50% or you could have it be all sub. Uh, sync, just like the other modern oscillator. And then also you've got Unison on both as well. So Unison basically lets you to duplicate the oscillator so we can duplicate it 16 times and then we can detune those against each other. So basically it lets you set up huge super saws. We can go into modern. It's going to sound a bit different, but same basic idea. So 
So yeah, you've uh, you've got unison abilities on these. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for those basic oscillators. Next, we have a wavetable oscillator here. Same stuff again. I'm not going to go into every time to change the pitch and stuff. You you can understand that. We can morph our wavetables here. And we can select the wavetables if we click in here. So we could go to something. Let's go to something third party. Let's do Venus Theory's wavetables. And let's go to Flow Belt 3. And move through that with the morph. So a really nice wavetable. We can also um, sort of... I guess you would call these like... They're like oscillator effects almost. So we can... the waveform a bit and that will do to the whole that will do to the entire wavetable and you can sort of see visibly what that's doing to the waveform you can also saturate it so this will have the effect of sort of bringing in more square wave harmonics if you want to think about it like that so at the very top here it's first of all louder but second of all it's taken on much more of a square shape and we can move into another, let's go for something computer here. And let's morph through that. Now if I take that saturate down. It's got much less of that distorted square wave sound. So yeah, definitely worth playing around with those. And then you've also got this formant. This is almost like um, in Serum or Massive, you have these uh, like bend plus and minus things that you can do to the wavetable. So let's say if we were to modulate these together, we could modulate the morph here. Let's choose a different, let's choose a different one. Let's go banjo here. And I'm just going to allow the, uh, maybe not banjo, let's go for something more obvious. Let's go for... Uh, Venus Theory FM. So you can hear it's morphing through the wavetable there. And then we could also say add another LFO here to the formant. So you can see by, by manipulating the formants and manipulating the morphs, you can kind of get infinite possibilities out of each of these wavetables. Uh, let's just uh, initialize that again and go to our wavetable. And uh, you can see here we can also skew horizontal. Again, this is sort of pinching the wavetable in that sort of bend plus minus sort of way. So yeah, definitely combining these as well as morphing through the oscillators. You can get a bunch of different sounds out of pretty much anything. We have Unison again here. We can go up to 16 voices. And uh, do the same thing that we were doing on the previous oscillators. So next we've got Window. So Window, basically what this is doing is... It's almost um, sort of mimicking what Amplitude Modulation would do. So we can sort of select a waveform here. So we've got a bunch of different options with our wavetables. Uh, let's come and go to uh, Growl here. And let's pull back the formant and stuff. And then we can set up a window. So we the window, basically, let me just, let me just show you. It's the easiest. So if we go Morph, we're basically morphing through our wavetable here. And then we select a frame we like. And we can mess around with the formant. But you can see there's sort of separate formants happening here. So you can almost see three distinct places this is happening. So as I change this, so if I change it to sign here, you can see the sine wave shape that's happening here. It's almost like amplitude modulation. Or if I go to cosine here, you can see that's slightly changed. Or I could go to triangle. Again, slightly different way of distributing the formants. Let's have a look at one of these weirder ones like Blend. And you can hear some of them sound pretty subtly different and some of them sound 
very, very different. Like I would imagine these square and rectangle ones are going to sound very different. So you can see the square wave here that's important. So yeah, it's almost like an, an amplitude modulation sort of effect. And then this is this formant is almost like increasing the pitch of the amplitude modulator. Or decreasing. So yeah, very cool oscillator type. Um, we also have a, a high cut and a low cut here, so we can do some filtering within the oscillator. Uh, we have to enable these first by right clicking and hitting enabled, and that will allow us to do that sort of stuff within the oscillator. So that's the windowed oscillator. Next we have sine. So this sine wave oscillator is particularly useful if you're doing the oscillator FM routing, um, because you can use sort of these different kind of sine waves based on old sort of FM synths. There's a lot of different shapes in here. And you can use these to FM each other. So let's have let's have one and two doing doing an FM thing. So now I've set up a simple two oscillator FM relationship here where um, oscillator two is going to FM oscillator one. And I've got oscillator one an octave lower than uh, the second oscillator. So if I increase the FM depth, you can hear the effects of that. And if I change the pitch, you can hear it changes drastically. Now, what we can hear as well is how different these sort of subtle sine waves are. So yeah, a bunch of different options for um, you to use for, mainly for FM. I mean, you can use these on their own, but 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 I think these are sort of set up with the idea of them being used as FM modulators in mind. You can also feed back into the oscillator, so we can now feed uh, oscillator 2 back into itself. And we could also feed oscillator 1 here, which is just a regular sine wave, back into itself. That's going to get pretty noisy pretty quickly if we're not careful. But uh, yeah, that's the uh, sine operator. We have a couple of other controls here. The high cut and low cut, just like in the last oscillator, have to be enabled. You may want that for FM because it can get pretty noisy. So you may want to cut out some of the higher low frequencies. We can also add unison like we've been able to in the other oscillators. And of course, we can change you know, our oscillator one here as well. So the other thing in this sine oscillator is we've got this behavior and uh, we've got same as FM2 and FM3, which is the new way it behaves. Um, it used to be slightly different from those oscillator types. So basically this is just here so that any patches that were made before it was updated sound the same, um, but it's much better in this context now because everything is more consistent. Speaking of FM2 and FM3, uh, we're going to now move on to them. So what are FM2 and FM3? Let's actually initialize the patch so we're not FMing anything twice here. So FM2 and FM3, very simply, are sine waves uh, that modulate each other. So we've got this base sine wave here that we're hearing, and then we can modulate it by this first, uh, this first sine wave here, which is M1. That'll give us a very basic FM sound. And uh, we can change the pitch of that, so we can change its ratio. So we could have it be double the pitch, and then sort of multiply it on upwards until it's extremely high frequency. And uh, then we have another modulator that's the exact same thing. So we have modulator two here, same thing. And we can change the ratio of that. So the other thing we've got here is a, an offset, and this will allow us to offset the pitch between uh, modulator one and modulator two. So you'll start to hear sort of a warbling effect as these go out of tune with each other. And then you can sort of take that to the extreme as well. Then we've also got a phase. This will offset the phases from each other. Um, you can sort of see this in the waveform, what this is doing. So let's bring up the amounts here. Uh, 
this generally is pretty subtle, but um, sometimes it might make it might make a difference to the sound, so it's good to have. And then feedback, which is going to feed back the main oscillator into itself after it's been FM'd by um, uh, M1 and M2. So that can get pretty noisy as well. FM3 I'm not going to go into because it's basically the same thing. The only real difference in FM3 is that we have this third oscillator here that we can also use and this is controlled in terms of frequency so so as opposed to using a ratio like we use with the others Yeah, we can create pretty crazy sounds using the three of those together, um, but I think you probably get the concept from FM2. So next we've got this string oscillator. Um, this is kind of moving into physical modeling territory. Um, so what this is designed to do is sort of give you a plucked string kind of a sound, basically. And you can do a couple of things um, to that sound to make it more to your liking. So first of all, let's skip this exciter part here. Then we've got the uh, we've got the level of the exciter. So currently our exciter is white noise. So the more we push it through, the more resonant it starts to become. And the more we bring it back, the kind of more plucky it's going to be. Then we've got string one and string two decay, so let's bring those down. So I'm holding my key down now, and that's how long it lasts. So let's bring up string one decay. So that's what string one sounds like. And that'll decay very slowly as I hold the note. Let's hear string two. You can hear they sound slightly different from each other. Uh, they're probably two different comb filters. That's generally how this is done. We send a noise burst. So you can see I've selected noise burst here through a couple of comb filters. And they sort of create this stringy effect. Now the next thing we can do is we can detune them from each other. And we also have the balance between them, so we can control their decay up here. And here we can control the balance between uh, string one and string two. Then we've got the stiffness control. And this can sort of work to sort of dampen out the strings of the higher or lower frequencies. So down here. more plucky it can kind of be better for bass and then as you come up get a much more brash sort of sound but let's have a listen to some of the different exciters so this is white uh, this is a white noise I believe it just says noise but I'm assuming it's white noise then pink noise here is a bit darker um, because pink noise has less high frequencies than white noise the attack also, there's a bit less attack on it. Then we've got sign. So now instead of using noise, we're using a sine wave. We've got triangle. So you can hear when we start using these other waveforms. It really can start to sound like a bass or something like that. Particularly when we mess around with some of these controls. So it will require pretty much a full tutorial to go into making sounds with this, but let's just have a listen to them. So you can hear with the stiffness as it goes up, it's sort of affecting sort of the formant of the waveform as well. And down here we're getting sort of a pluckier, more low frequency effect. 
So this is a really good oscillator for making sort of plucky basses and stuff like that, um, as you would expect, because basses have strings. Then we've got these constants, which are, you know, not bursts. So now we've got white noise going through the whole time, or we've got a constant sweep. So yeah, lots of weird stuff you can do with that oscillator. I'll probably do a separate video on, you know, different sound design things that you can do with the string oscillator, but just so now that we understand how it works. Next, we've got twist. Uh, twist is basically a, a miscellaneous, um, basically a bunch of miscellaneous oscillators. Um, I think they may be taken from somewhere, some 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 code or that might be based on something I'm not positive but basically you got a bunch of different things in here so I'm very quickly going to touch on each of these oscillators and twist we're not going to go mad into detail on them but uh, just so you understand basically what they are the first one here is waveforms you kind of start off with a triangle wave here and then you can kind of deshape it with these square and saw shapes and then that kind of goes up into a sort of a sync sound so you can see the sort of uh, the square sinkage that's happening there and then you've also got this saw wave that you can bring in so you can see that saw shape coming through there you can definitely get some sort of weird cool um waveform shapes out of that so next we've got the wave shaper and the wave shaper basically gives you a waveform and you can basically sort of skew it with these different controls. So you've got this wave shaper here that distorts the waveform. Then you've got fold. Which sort of brings in almost an FME kind of distortion. And then you can bring in this asymmetrical. And depending on how you combine these, you know, we can get closer to sort of a sine wave. can shape it into these crazy shapes and these are great to modulate as well and then we've got a variation mix which allows us to kind of move between i suppose different variations of wave shaping so there's a lot of really cool waveforms you can get out of this and next we've got this LPG, and the LPG, I think it stands for low pass gate. This is basically a, a, a pluck low pass filter that's built into the oscillator. So if I bring up this, if I enable it, so I've got it enabled here, and I bring up the decay. Can hear we've kind of got a pluck going on. And then we've got response. Sort of letting more high frequencies through, but this LPG, the reason it's called a low pass gate is it's decreasing the frequencies and the volume at the sort of same time. So it gives you a unique kind of plucky sound. And that's on quite a few of these operators. Now we've got two operator FM. This should be pretty familiar idea to us because um, let's just turn off this low pass gate. So next we've got two operator FM. This should be a pretty familiar idea to us. So what we can do is we can bring in FM here from another oscillator, and then we can change the ratio. And we can also feed back. And we can bring in sort of a submix here for some low frequencies. So yeah, very simple little oscillator, but you can get some cool sounds out of it. Then we've got uh, this formant and phase distortion oscillator. So this formant slash phase distortion, basically this is going to allow us to distort the phase of an oscillator in various ways and uh, sort of mess with the formant of that. So the best way is to hear it. Kind of got a similar vibe, digital sort of vibe to FM. So we've got this ratio type and then we've got this forming control. And this sort of works similarly to how our... Um, 
our uh, window control worked, where we're sort of increasing the frequency of this this format. And then we've got shape. And then we can also change the shape down here. So by messing with these, the format and the ratio, you can get a bunch of sort of vocal sounding sounds. And this is especially good as an FM modulator as well. So you can hear everything kind of that you get out of this when you're modulating that has a sort of vocal quality to it. So yeah, that's the formant and phase distortion. So next we've got harmonic here. And uh, harmonic is sort of um, almost like an organ-y type of oscillator. So it sounds to me like we're mixing a bunch of sine waves together and then we're kind of changing how they're laid out. So if we go through this organ mix here and then I change the peak. You can hear we've got different frequencies coming in and out. Then we've got bump. Again, this seems to be changing the relationship and frequencies between stuff. It's almost like we've got sine waves stacked on top of each other. So yeah, this seems to be really good for like weird organ-y kind of sounds. And uh, also, you can do some weird sort of additive sounding. Especially in the low registers. Yeah, kind of a weird oscillator, but uh, there's a lot of cool sounds that you can get out of that as well. So that's the harmonic oscillator. Next, we've got wavetable. I'm not going to go through this too much because there is another wavetable oscillator, but this one is slightly different in uh, we can sort of morph through the wavetable on multiple axes. So we've got a, a bank here. So we can morph through various banks of wavetables and we can select one and then we can move through on the X and Y axis. Again, I'm not exactly sure how this is set up, but I, what I would imagine is if we've got this grid here and you imagine that the wavetables are set up where it can move through them both horizontally and vertically, um, it just gives you more options on how to move through it. So there's definitely some cool sounds in there as well. Then we've got this lo-fi mix. This is sort of bringing in a digital edge. Uh, it's probably doing some, some minor bit crushing or something like that. And we've got our low-pass gate and our low-pass gate uh, decay like we have in the other oscillators as well. So next we've got chords here. Um, so chords basically allows you to morph between a bunch of chords. Uh, so we've got this root mix, which is very important. If this is 100%, you're not really going to hear many chords. So let's set it to around 50% here. First here we've got an octave. Then we move up to a fifth or a power chord. Then we've got a suspend of four. Minor chord. Minor seven, minor nine, minor eleven and so on into the major chords, major sevens, major nines, everything is in there. And you can also change the inversions. It'll give you the same notes, but there's, the pitches are sort of oriented differently. And yeah, that's basically it. It can be a cool one to modulate. So for instance, if we move through, if we move through, uh, by the way, the, the key is based on whatever key you're pushing. So it will basically, you know, give you all the chords uh, based on that key that you hit, but if you modulate it, you can get some really weird sounds. Again, cool little weird oscillator that's in there, um, and it can be cool for certain stuff. And next we've got vowel speech. This is an oscillator that's basically designed to allow you to create vocal sounds by manipulating various parameters here. Again, this video is going to get really long if I go into every single oscillator in detail, but basically you can create some weird vocal kind of sounds by messing with these parameters here. And the best way to do it is just to do it by ear. So next we've got granular cloud and granular cloud basically starts us off with a waveform, a saw wave, and we can mix in a sine wave here as well. 
But uh, basically what this allows us to do is uh, have a number of grains so we can decrease their duration. You can kind of hear the grains cutting out there. And we've got our density set up really high. Let's bring that back. It's going to start to be much more clicky and rumbly because there's very few grains happening. So you can get really nice random clicky noises with this. And as we bring up the duration, start to hear that saw wave coming through again. And if we bring up the density a lot, we can also randomly pitch these. And it'll start to sound a bit like a super saw at first. And then as we go, it's going to become nonsense, very detuned. So yeah, cool little granular oscillator there that you can do with synthesis. So filtered noise here will allow you to select a type of noise, basically it's brightness. It sort of filter out some of the frequencies. You can also affect the clock frequency, which will sort of have this lo-fi effect and eventually it'll, it'll morph down into crackles because the frequency is so low. Then we've got resonance here. So we can bring in this dual pig mix. You can sort of hear the resonance of the frequency we've got it set at. So you can create a bunch of different noise sounds with this. Again, I'm not going to go into it too much detail. Particle noise. Just a different noise generator. So we can have sort of really dense noise that sounds like white noise. You can set how random the frequencies are. Filter types. So a great way of creating crackles, vinyl sounds, stuff like that. Next we've got inharmonic string. And this is sort of another oscillator in the physical modeling realm. And this is great for sort of creating brash inharmonic sounds. So it can be a great thing to layer with pads or, or stuff like that, or even just as sound effects. A bunch of different weird sounds you can get out of it. You can even get these weird sort of percussion sounds. So yeah, that's inharmonic string. Modal resonator again. I encourage you to look into all these in more detail, but this is another way. Again, modal resonator, it's very similar to some of the other oscillators. You get a few controls and uh, it's basically set up to be another sort of physical modeling type of thing. get sort of windy sort of sounds with it. So next we've got analog kick. This is designed to sort of let you quickly make some kick drum sounds. You may want to team this up with using the amplitude envelope to get the sort of decay that you want on it. Um, if you actually want to make good kicks in Surge, um, I would recommend mixing this with other oscillators and not just using it by itself, but it's cool to have in there. Next we have this analog snare. So we've got this sort of tone and noise mix. And we can manipulate the two of them to sort of get the snare sound we're after. Also, pitch is going to make a big difference here. And also the decay of our amp envelope will tighten things up. And then finally, we have a hi-hat. Very similar to the snare. So we've got like some filtering that we can do. We can mess with the decay. Got this variation mix in for sort of giving us a different timbre. And then obviously you're gonna wanna manipulate the, um, the amplitude envelope here to get exactly what you want. 
And don't be afraid to manipulate the attack and the decay. You can create shakers. Again, pitch makes a big difference. This one is the one I out of the drum sense that I actually think is the best. I think you can get a lot of uh, very convincing, cool hi-hat sounds out of this. So yeah, that's that's just a brief overview of everything in the twist oscillator. I can't go too into detail on them. There's just too much stuff in there. So next we have Alias, and Alias is sort of designed to be almost like the video game oscillator, so you can create, you know, chip y sort of sounds. So you can degrade these oscillators, these basic shapes. You know, you've got ramps and pulses and, and sign. Um, so you can do things like bit crush them. And then manipulate them in these other ways. So you can see we can sort of squareify it. And then warp the wave as well. And it just tends to give us that really sort of alias-y, you know, almost chip tune -y kind of sound. But it's cool for other stuff too. You can create really... Weird sounds that have nothing to do with that. You can even bring audio into this. So yeah, there's a bunch of weird things you can bring in here. Like you can bring audio in here. You can um, add some of those TX waveforms. And it's even got some weird stuff like memory from oscillator data, step sequencer data, uh, DAW chunk data. So you can get really weird aliasy, glitchy sort of sounds out of this. Let's bring in uh, oscillator data. So yeah, you can bring in a whole load of weird glitchy stuff into this and get crazy sounds. So it's definitely worth experimenting with. And just while we're on this alias oscillator, one of the best things about the alias oscillator here is it has this additive shape that you can select. So you've got all these regular shapes and then you've got this additive one. And what this additive one actually lets you do is a little bit different to the others. It starts off with this sort of a saw wave shape, but you can actually click this edit button here and it will bring you into an additive menu where you can individually change the partials and basically draw your own oscillator shapes. And you can see if we close this, we've got this crazy oscillator shape now and we can edit it more. So you can basically draw whatever sort of oscillator shape that you want within here. There's also some presets, so you can just go with a sign and that'll just give you one partial. Or you could do a square and that's gonna give you the odd partials. And then once you start one of these presets, you can sort of edit it from there. So that's one of the coolest options that's within this alias oscillator. So next we have sample and whole noise. Sample and whole noise is basically using sampling. So it's sampling a waveform at sort of random points. And we're sort of getting a bunch of different clicks. So you can hear as I bring the correlation down. You can really hear that we're just getting sporadic random little clicks. And as I bring it up, it sounds more like a waveform. And basically it's using that idea to create noise. And this is allowing us to change the shape of the waveform. But uh, the thing I recommend doing with this is extending the range of the pitch. And as you bring it up into these high frequencies, You can create a bunch of really weird bunch of really weird noise types. And that pretty much does it for the oscillators. Um, we also have an audio input, so we can take a stereo, a left or a right input. Um, so you can basically put anything you want. If you wanted to put a guitar through Surge or something like that, you can use the effects. You can use the filters and everything like that. But uh, yeah, that concludes the oscillator section of Surge. Okay, so next we're on to the control section here of the synth, and that's this sort of big area here. So this contains everything from, you know, how we set our pitch bend range, or whether it's mono or poly, to oscillator FM routing, which will let us FM between the oscillators. Filter configuration, this one is extremely important, 
Um, a lot of people struggle to understand what this is doing and if you don't understand what this section is doing it can lead to headaches with your sounds that you may not understand. It's very important to understand what this section is doing. Scene output, relatively simple. Uh, then we've got you know our mixer and pitch settings and then we've got our filters and envelopes and all that. Anyway we'll get into them in detail one by one. Uh, so let's just start here simply with bend depth. This couldn't be simpler. By default this will allow you to use your pitch wheel to bend the note up and down two semitones. And then you can control how many semitones you would like to bend up or down. So you can go all the way up to 24, which is two octaves up and two octaves down. Don't think that requires any further explanation. Uh, the next one to have a look at is these settings for uh, whether the synth is mono or poly. By default, it's going to be set to poly, which simply means you can play multiple notes at once. Uh, the amount of notes that you can play at once is controlled by this poly counter up here. So you can set it to be as low as two. And then when I add a new note, it's going to cancel out one of the old ones. And uh, yeah, you can set that to be as much as 64, as I said at the start. Let's just leave it at default for now. Next, you've got mono. Mono is very simple. When I play a new note, the old note dies. That's all that mono means. And then we've got latch. This is another really simple one to understand. Latch basically is the same as mono, but it's going to hold my note down until I hit a new note. So if I just press a key here, when I'm in mono, you know, it's there for as long as I hit it. And then it's gone. If I hold, if I put latch on, it's going to hold my last note till I hit a new one. And that's latch. So next we have mono single trigger uh, or mono ST. This is very simple as well. Um, what this is going to allow us to do is uh, the easiest way to show this off is if I just put a filter on this and let's make it resonant and then let's make that filter. Uh, it doesn't matter if you don't understand what I'm doing here. I'll get into it later, but let's make that filter be controlled by the envelope and let's give it a long decay. Somewhere around there. So, what is the difference between mono and mono ST? So, mono, if I, whenever I hit a new note, so I'll just keep my note held down and I'll hit a new one. You can see that it's restarting that filter envelope every time I hit a new note. And if I hold, if I put it onto mono ST here and I hold the note down, every time I add a new note, it's actually going to continue that filter. So it's not restarting this uh, this filter envelope. And then back to mono. You can see that it's restarting every time I hit a new note. Um, the thing to understand with this mono ST as well is if there's a gap between the notes, if they're not overlapping, then it will actually restart the envelope. So if I just hit a note and then hit another note, it starts at the beginning of the envelope. But of course, if I keep the notes held, it won't restart. So the next one we have here is Mono FP, and that stands for Mono Fingered Portamento. And what that means is that uh, it's basically to do with the way we've got the Portamento set up. So let's set up Portamento here on Mono. And you can see that it's sliding between each note. Right, and if I go to this mono FP here, what this is gonna do is it will only slide between notes if they overlap. So if I'm holding a key, and then I hold the next one, let's make that portamento longer. If I hold the key and then I add the next note, it will slide between them. But if there's a gap between them, so if I play one and then play another, there won't be a slide between them. So it's going straight from one note to the other. And if I hold the first note down, then we get our portamento. And then mono ST plus FP is just both of these together. So we get our single trigger where our uh, envelopes are going to continue on. So let's set that up again. Let's just set up our filter here and have it go to the envelope. So now if I hold down the first note, it will glide in pitch to the next note, and it also won't re-trigger the filter envelope. So we get this sort of effect. And 
if I do sort of the exact same thing with mono, you can hear how drastically different that's going to sound. Okay, so that's pretty much it for those uh, play modes. And if we right click, we get some additional options for no priority. So currently, if it's in mono, let's just turn down that portamento because it's kind of annoying. So currently, if it's in if it's in mono, it's going to prioritize the last note. So that means that if I play a new note, it cuts off the old note. Very simple. Then we've got no priority high. This will prioritize the highest pitch. So if I'm hitting a key now that's below that. It's not going to change notes. But if I hit a key that's above it, it will. And I'm just going to go down and pitch so you can see that it will stop changing once I go below the original note. Now I'm going below and it will no longer change notes. We've also got no priority low. This will only change the note if it's lower than the one currently held. And if I try to go above, it's not going to change the note. And finally, we've got legacy mode here. And legacy mode is just here so that any patches that were made in the older version of Surge will behave the same as far as no priority goes. So next, we're gonna move on to this oscillator FM routing. This is very simple. This is just gonna allow us to use these three oscillators that we have to FM each other. So the most basic relationship here is we can hit this first one, which is oscillator two. And you can see it's indicated by the arrow is gonna FM oscillator one. And that's decided by this FM depth. So the more that we bring this up, the more FM we get. And that will eventually make its way into noise. Um, then uh, just to show you as well, so oscillator two here or oscillator one, so we can have whichever oscillator we want. Um, we can set it up to be any of these oscillator types. So we could have it be say this alias oscillator and we could go in and go to our additive and then edit and create our own oscillator shape and then use that. That shape now to FM our first oscillator. This is not an FM tutorial. Um, if you want, I actually have a pretty long FM tutorial on this channel. Um, it's using Vital, but it kind of gives you the concepts of FM. But basically what's very important with FM is the oscillator shape and also the pitch relationship between the two oscillators. So it sounds drastically different. Depending on the pitch relationship we've got set up. Then the next option here is very simple. So oscillator three is going to FM oscillator two, and then oscillator two is going to FM oscillator one. So let's pull this back a bit because it's gonna be pretty crazy. And let's uh, make the oscillator shape for two a little less crazy. So now we've got this. Now oscillator three, let's change the pitch. Maybe change the waveform. And then the next one is a little bit different. Um, instead of oscillator three FMing oscillator two, in this third set in here, it's actually going to also FM oscillator one. And this is generally going to be a little bit less harsh because when we've got three FMing oscillator two, as oscillator 2 is going to be pretty distorted and and complex sounding by the time it gets to oscillator 1. But in this setup, we have two sort of simpler waveforms that are FMing oscillator 1, which is our output oscillator. And just to note as well, um, if we wanted to have an FM relationship set up here, but we also want to hear the, the oscillators that are doing the FM, we can just unmute them in the mixer down here. So let's say we wanted to hear oscillator three as well as having it FM oscillator one. We just unmute it here. Or we can even just hear it by itself and change it. And then mix in the FM signal and we can still change the FM amount. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the oscillator FM routing section. Um, one of the other things to note in here is um, 
the noise. So the noise is in the chain here and you can see that is just directly outputted. So after the output of these oscillators are put out, the noise is then mixed in. So the noise is not FMing any of the oscillators. It's basically just being mixed in with them. Okay, so the next section here that's extremely important to understand is this filter configuration section. This allows us to set up the filters basically however we want. So first of all, let's familiarize ourselves with what we're actually looking at here. So it, by default, it's set to this setting. And if you right click, you can select the settings here uh, by their name. So we've got serial one through three. We've got dual one and two, stereo ring and wide. Um, and those correspond to these selections that we can make down here. So obviously this is serial one, and then we can select them as we'd like. By default, it's on this wide one, which is quite important because it's stereo. So for instance, if I add unison, we get a stereo signal, and you can see that up here. See how the left and right channels are fluctuating. If we set it to serial one here, you can see we've only got one line instead of two. And that's letting through a mono signal. So see, left and right channels are the same. So that's the first thing to, to understand. But let's have a look before we go into any of that, really. Let's just have a quick look at what we're actually looking at here. So this is our signal. And this is coming into filter one, which is located here. Then it goes through the wave shaper, which is located here. And then it goes to filter two, which is located here. So pulse the wave shaper, we're filtering again. Then it goes to our amplitude output. This is our amp and this is our amp envelope. So this is basically our, our output volume section, you could think of it as. And uh, after it goes through that, it goes into a feedback loop and feedbacks into itself. If you don't understand what feedback is, basically we're sending the signal through again, sort of makes the signal sound a bit more distorted and stuff like that. So now that we understand what we're looking at, oh yeah, and this is the high pass filter. So you can see there's a high pass filter here. So this will allow us to take out some of the low frequencies uh, in the signal. So it goes through that after it goes through the, the amp, the amp section here. So let's start here with serial one. So serial one, very simple, mono signal again, very important to understand. So any, no matter how wide the oscillator is set up to be, if I put it through this, it's gonna come out mono. Um, this is very simple. So we've got filter one here. So let's just, uh, let's actually just turn off that unison. Just hear a, a saw wave going through here. So let's go for 24 dB low pass. So there's our filter one. And then filter one is gonna go into the wave shaper here. So let's select something for the wave shaper. Let's select some weird sort of so now filter one going through the wave shaper then it's going to come through filter two so let's use another low pass and now you can see all those high frequencies are gone and we're not going to be able to bring them back because we're low we're, we're low passing them and this filter is not going through the wave shaper so until we increase this you're not going to hear those sort of distorted high frequencies and uh, then that goes to the amp envelope here so if we were to set up our amp, env amp envelope differently and then that goes to the high pass filter so we can take out all the low frequencies we want there so that's the first um serial one there and now let's go to serial two which is here and serial two is basically exactly the same as serial one except now we have a feedback loop so we can now use this feedback control to feed the sound back into the filter so And this is going to give us a more distorted sound. It's also feeding back into this wave shaper, so we're sort of pushing into this wave shaper a bit harder. And that's basically the only difference between uh, Serial 1 and Serial 2. Now we have Serial 3. This puts Filter 2 after the amplitude envelope and sort of right before the feedback loop. And you can hear right away it sounds pretty different. It's louder for one. So yeah, that is uh, that is serial three. Now we have these these two options here, which is dual one and dual two. These are putting the filters in parallel. So instead of one coming after the other, they're sort of both happening at the same time. 
So right away, you can hear that that is not ideal for what we want here. So now they're, they're both sort of happening at the same time, so one isn't going through the other. And then both are being passed through. Let's use a different filter here. So let's use, um, let's use this band pass. So the, the easiest way to tell here is you can tell I'm using this band pass, but we still have low frequencies because it's also going through this low pass filter. But if I send it through one of these serial ones, you can hear we're losing all those low frequencies because the band pass filter is coming after the low pass filter. Now, the only difference between dual one and dual two really is that in dual two here, um, only filter one is going through this wave shaper. So you can hear this, this second bandpass filter sounds really clean because it's not being distorted by this wave shaper. And then of course we can feed that back in. In which case now it is sort of going through the wave shaper. And yeah, that is it for the sort of basic serial and parallel setups. Let's just initialize the patch here and have a look at the last few. So now we've got left and right. Left and right is going to basically have filter one and filter two be on separate channels. So one of them is left and one of them is right. So let's put a low pass filter on filter one and a also low pass filter on filter two. And now you can hear, let's up the resonance, that as I change these, maybe the best way to do this is with two different LFOs. Let's use LFO 2 here at a different rate. So now you can hear that the filters are both on different sides. So if we take the filter balance over here, so this will allow us to mix between filter one and filter two, let's go to filter one. Filter two. So that's a great way to get stereo filtering sounds in Surge. This can be really nice for adding stereo widths and things. You can do super obvious stuff like that, or you can just have subtle differences between the filters and it will just add a bit more stereo depth. So the next setting that we have here is ring, and this is going to basically ring modulate the filters against each other. So instead of being added together, they're now being multiplied by each other. So you can see this is them when they're being added together. It sounds like this. And then ring mod is going to multiply them. So the same sort of chain setup sounds drastically different when you do that. And of course you have your feedback then as well. So it's just a way to get, I suppose, different kind of sounds as well. And then finally, we have our stereo filter, and this is actually the sort of default setting. So basically the only difference between this and the first one, as I said in the beginning, is that this is fully stereo. So filter one goes into the wave shaper, goes into filter two, goes into the amp, and then we have a feedback loop before the high pass filter. And that's all stereo. So if we set up our unison, we're gonna get full stereo goodness instead of uh, sad mono sound. So I think if you understand the filter configuration, you're pretty good for the rest. That's probably the most complicated thing to understand. And even that's fairly simple once you understand sort of what you're looking at in here. It's very simple, it's very visual, um, it's very well laid out. So finally, at the top here, um, we have the scene output. This couldn't be simpler. So as I said earlier, we've got A and B. These are two separate scenes. And this is just controlling the volume for our overall scene A. So volume up, volume down. So if I go to B here, that still has its default value. And then if I put them together, this is how you would sort of mix them is just by controlling the volumes on each channel, or we could even pan them both to separate sides. So now A is on one side and B is on the other side. So the next thing we have here is width, and this will allow us to control the stereo width of the output of the scene. So if I've got uh, a bunch of unison voices on here, see we've got a big stereo sound. If I set this width to zero, 
Now it's mono. And it's very important to understand the middle here is zero. So this is plus 100%. And this is minus 100%. They are both stereo. It's just, as far as I know, it's just inverting sort of which way around the stereo width is. But uh, the middle here is what's going to make it mono. And the last two controls we've got here, um, it's actually four controls, and we'll find out how to find the two hidden controls here now in a second. Um, these are our send effects. So I know I haven't got into effects yet, but basically here's scene A and here's scene B. They have their own individual insert effects here, which go in these four boxes. And then those, after we've gone through those insert effects on A and B, so these are individual to each of the scenes, then they go into a master effects section. So these four effects here, and these go on both of the scenes after they've had their own effects, okay? So then finally in the middle here, we have our send effects. So these are effects that we can send A and B to if we like. So you can see by the little arrows in here how that works. So we can have A going through its own effects, and then we could say have a delay here in the middle that we send both A and B to, so they can kind of interact with them. And it will um, allow us also to have a certain amount of dry signal coming through as well. So generally you'll want this for reverbs and delays and stuff like that. So this will allow us to send. So uh, we've got on number one here, we've got delay. <laughs> So I can send the level and the amount that I send it. It's just going to determine the amount of the signal that's going to the effect. And then we've got send two. So here I've got a spring reverb. So if I send to that, the more I send to it, the more I'm getting. So now you might be wondering how we send to these other two effects that we've got here. So on this third one here, I've put a flanger. And if I click on it, you can see that now send effects three and send effects four come up here. So now I can send to that flange. Or I can send to this second reverb that I've got here on four. And then if I want to get back to um, these first two effects, I just click on one of them and then I'm back to send effects one and send effects two. Now we're onto a very simple section here. So we've got the scene pitch and uh, portamento controls and stuff like that. Also, uh, I just forgot to mention while I was up here um, about the oscillator drift and noise color. I wanted to kind of tie them in with this section because I feel like they're more related to this than they are to the, the poly and stuff. So we've got our scene octave selection here. This will allow us to change the octave of the entire scene. <laughs> And the difference between that and doing it in the oscillator here is obviously if we've got two oscillators mixed together, I can change the pitch of oscillator one. Oscillator two remains the same. And let's say I want to bring the whole lot down one octave. Both of them get shifted down an octave. Very, very simple. Uh, then we've got a pitch. And this allows us to control in semitones the pitch. By default, it's seven, the same as the oscillators. And we can also right click here and go extend range. And that'll let us get into the, the crazy levels there as well. Uh, so that's basically all that's important about that. Then we've got portamento, which we touched on earlier. This just allows us to glide between notes. And the, the higher this is set to, the longer that's going to be. So now it's going to take four seconds to get to the next pitch. Or we can have it be really short, where it takes 0.02 of a second. That can be a nice effect in some things. You can also right click on this and tempo sync it. So if you wanted the, the pitch change to be exact, so like let's say we wanted it to be um, a 16th dotted note. That can be really important for some sounds to have it tempo synced, so that option is there as well. And uh, let's just turn off this other oscillator. Just wanted to mention while we're sort of talking about pitch and stuff, we've got this oscillator drift parameter. And uh, if I say set this whole thing to default again, so that we've got two oscillators that are the same pitch, mixed together, you can see it doesn't sound very interesting. We can now introduce this oscillator drift. And this is subtly changing the phase and the pitch of the oscillators, but it's doing it at a different rate. So they kind of, they kind of, um, they kind of rub off each other at sort of different pitches and phases. It makes it sound a little bit more analog. 
You can even, say, pan these oscillators in different directions and get sort of a stereo effect doing that. And uh, finally, we've got this noise color here, and that kind of ties into the mixer. Okay, and kind of while we've been doing all this stuff, I've been using the mixer down here, so you probably have a pretty good idea of how this works. Um, basically, really simple controls like you would find in your DAW. We've got a mute, so if I want to mute oscillator one, that's oscillator one muted, or I can unmute it. If I had everything active here, which would sound pretty wild, I and I just want to hear, say, oscillator three, I could solo it. And that will allow me to just hear oscillator three. For now, let's mute everything that's not oscillator one. Then what else can I do here? I can pan. So I can put oscillator one to the left or the right, or I can have it in the center. And obviously that can be controlled individually for the oscillators and the noise. And also, um, as well as being able to do that, I can control the volume. So this is a good way to mix between the oscillators. So, you know, I might want oscillator three might be higher in pitch. I may want that to be lower or higher in volume. So you can control pretty much everything you'd want to do there. Uh, the other thing to note about the mixer here, let's just initialize the patch again, is that we've got these two ring mod outputs here. And these are just different ring modulation relationships that we can mix in on top of the oscillators or we can just have them by themselves. So let's mute oscillator one for now and unmute this uh, 1x2. So what this does is multiplies oscillator one by oscillator two. Sounds pretty boring right now. But if we do something to oscillator two, like maybe change the pitch, we can start to really hear that ring mod relationship. And you can mix this in with, say, oscillator one. Or we could maybe change the, the um, maybe let's change the oscillator here to something weird. So now you can hear, even though we're not hearing oscillator 2 because it's muted, we can still have access to this ring modulation uh, mix of oscillator 1 and 2. We also have one of those for 2 or 3. I'm not going to show that off because it's basically the same thing. It's just, you know, the changes I make to 3 or the changes I make to 2 are going to change the sound. And then finally here we have a noise. And this is why I waited to cover this noise color thing here, because obviously if we don't have the noise turned on, or we don't know how to turn it on, it doesn't matter what color it is. So we have a mixer for our noise here, so we can have it muted or soloed, or turn it up and down, same as everything else. And we have a noise color here, which is basically a filter, so if we go here, we get bright, let's just uh, have the noise by itself. So when we go up, we're sort of high passing it, getting brighter. And then as we go down here, sort of get more resonant, darker sounds. So it gets less resonant, brighter, more resonant and darker. So we kind of have a low rumble down here. And that is basically it for the mixer section and our oscillator drift and noise controls. Uh, the last thing to note here is we have an overall gain. This is just, so say we have oscillator one and two. Let's just say we want to turn the whole lot down. That'll turn everything down or we can turn both of them up at the same time using the gain. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Also, it's worth noting that the gain here is probably going to have a pretty big effect on the filter because we're sort of pushing into the filter here. So that being said, let's look at the filter section. You probably already have a bit of an idea of how it works, but there's a couple of extra things that we're going to want to look at here that aren't necessarily obvious. So let's just focus on one filter. The filters are essentially identical. There's a couple of extra settings over here that have to do with how the filters interact with each other. We already understand how to set the filters up. Um, if you've clicked forward in the video to understand the filter section and you haven't watched the part of the video about the filter configuration, please go and watch that part of the video because it's super important if you're dealing with the filters. So filter. Basically, we have a bunch of different filter types. We've got low pass, band pass, high pass, notch, multi, effect. These are all just different types of filters, some of them standard, some of them more interesting. Um, we can we can disable our filter here um, or we can enable it. And that's basically all there is to it. So we've got a bunch of different low passes. Some of these are sort of Serge's own ones. And then we've got these sort of legacy ladder, vintage ladder. These are sort of based on Moog filters. 
So you can hear these all sound pretty different. Let's go for a K35 here. I think this is based on some Korg filter. So you can hear that sounds drastically different. There is something I want to call your attention to, though, when we go to some of these filters. And you may not have even noticed it, but something popped up here, and it's this uh, one and two that we can switch between by clicking. And these are actually variations of the filter we've selected. So if you right click here, you can see we've got a standard and a pushed, which is a sort of more distorted version of the filter. And we have those for a lot of them. We don't have them for some, but we do for a lot. So in here, you can see we've got a clean, driven and a smooth. And they all sound quite different. Let's see what else have we got. If we go into cut off warp here, we have a bunch of different weird ones. So these are different sort of clipping stages. You can hear they all sound drastically different. So we have all these different filters in here, but we also have variations on most of them. And anytime you see these, this sort of extra square come up here, that's how you know there's a variation available. And the amount varies massively between the filters. So some of them have one or two variations. And then some of them have, uh, like this cutoff warp has like 12 or 13. So you can come into these weirder ones like, you know, the comb or the cutoff all pass. And then we have, you know, 100% wet. And then let's see what other effect ones we've got in here. We've got, um, we've got sample and hold. So sort of I think this doesn't have an option for variations. And then we've got this multi tripole. And this has some variations as well. So you can see there's a bunch of different high, low passed, low first or low second. Loads of different variations of this that are going to sound completely different. So yeah, definitely check out all the filters and all their variations. Um, because there's some pretty cool stuff in there. And you can also have, you know, the same filter on both, but have a different variation on the different filters. So the next thing to have a look at here, and we're just going to use a basic low pass for this that's very resonant, is the Wave Shaper. So the Wave Shaper is basically a distortion unit. So you can hear it's just distorting the signal. But what makes this particular wave shaper very cool is all the options we have. So we have basic saturation, and then we have some of these crazy wave fold and fuzz trigonometry. And the, the, let's just flick through a couple of these with the cutoff set at the same point. So you can hear we can get vastly different sounds out of you know, the same sort of filter setting just by changing these wave shapers. Another thing that's good to note about the wave shaper is we have this sort of view here. And as we push, it's sort of showing us the effect it's going to have on our signal. So let's push into this and let's move through. Them. So you can see when we've got them pushed really hard, they're just going to sort of square. You can see, especially with some of these uh, let's go for some of these trigonometry ones. You can see this is having a pretty crazy effect on the signal. But there's a bunch of stuff you can do with sound design with all of these wave shaper options. Now, moving on, I touched on this before, but we've got a filter balance. So let's say we had, you know, some crazy comb filter here on... Uh, on filter two, and we add, you know, just a band pass. We can mix between them, so this is all filter one, and this is all filter two. So any changes we make here aren't gonna make a difference. So we go back, and we mix them together. So the other thing we've got here is a key track. Key track is very simple. All this is gonna do is as I play a note, the filter is gonna follow it. So the lower I play it, the lower it's gonna move the cutoff, and the higher the note I play, the higher the cutoff is gonna be. So that can be very useful for some sounds. And we've got, uh, independently, we've got an amount of key track for um, filter one and filter two. And we can also set a center frequency, so. This is going to set sort of at which note 
the cutoff is centered. So the lower we set it, the higher it's going to be. And the, the higher we set it, the lower our cutoff is going to be. And then finally here we've got a high pass filter. And this is just going to take out the low frequencies at the end of the chain, like I said earlier with the filter configuration. The next thing to be aware of here is the filter envelope. And this is basically a envelope controller for the filter. Very simple. So you can send it to either filter one or filter two by increasing the amount. So now we've got this plucky filter sound. If we increase the attack, it's going to sort of bring up the attack and then bring it back down. Anyway, I'm not going to go into detail about explaining um, envelopes. I've done that in another video. You can find it on my channel. There's a couple of things in this filter envelope that you may not have actually noticed at first glance. First of all, there's two different settings for the filter envelope. There is this analog one, which is kind of tends to be a bit snappier because um, it's got sort of a more curvy profile. And then there's digital and digital has these little bars that you can see in here. And these actually allow you to change the curvature of the digital filter. So you can see if I bring this out, the curve gets much tighter here. And if I bring it back, and it's the same for the uh, attack envelope here as well. You can change the curve of the attack drastically. And even the release here. So yeah, that digital filter is just giving you extra shaping options. And they can also be selected by right clicking and you can select linear, quadratic or cubic here and it will change it to the appropriate setting. Everything I just said for the filter envelope, uh, just so I don't come back to it later and bore you, also applies to the amp envelope. So you've got the digital analog settings and you can change the curvature of the amp in here. Now, there's just a couple of extra controls to look at in this secondary filter. So if I set up my low pass here on my first filter, there are a couple of options here on the second filter. So I can control the second filter completely independently if I want. Control the resonance independently in the cutoff. Or I can hit this plus button here. That sort of looks like a plus. And I get an offset. So instead of independently controlling it, it sort of takes the cutoff of filter one. So let's just set... Um, set this filter balance so we only hear filter two. It sort of takes filter one setting as a center frequency and then I can offset from that. So let's hear them together now. And as I move this, both will move. And we can also link the resonance so that any resonance change that I make to filter one will also affect filter two. So that's pretty much it for this middle section. Uh, there's only one real other thing to talk about in the amp section here, because I think everything else is pretty self-explanatory, given what we've talked about already. Um, the velocity, um, the way it works here is probably a little bit counterintuitive to most people. So by default, velocity is set to this maximum value here. And you might notice it's not really affecting the velocity at all. There's no difference no matter how hard I hit the key. Um, the velocity seems to basically set the minimum, uh, the, the I suppose the minimum volume that we can have with velocity. So by default, it's at zero, which means, you know, everything is going to be zero dB. And if we set it down here, the different velocities I hit the key at will actually make a difference. And that is pretty much it for the control section of Surge. Okay, so this next section we're gonna look at here is the effects section, probably one of the simplest sections we're gonna look at. Um, we've already touched on this quite a bit, but we, I suppose, need to go into it in detail just so we understand everything about it. Um, we're just gonna probably make, I don't know, some sort of a simple pad sound here or something just to show off different use cases for the effects section. So first thing to talk about here is by default, um, when Surge's output here reaches plus 18 decibels, it's going to hard clip the output. Um, you can change that setting by right clicking on scene A or scene B in here. You can turn it off. Um, I honestly 
don't recommend that. Uh, it is good for it to hard clip at some point, or you can set it to zero dBs, which means when it gets to zero, it'll hard clip. But if that's something you want to change, that option is accessible here. The next thing to talk about is how this is actually set up and what we're looking at. So scene A and scene B, as we talked about before, two separate sections. Scene A goes through these four effects exclusively. Scene B cannot come up and go through any of these effects. It's impossible. Uh, scene B goes through these effects. Again, same rules apply. Scene A can go through those. They share these effects in that you can send a portion of the signal from scene A after its effects into these send effects, or you can send a bit of scene B after its effects into these effects. I'll explain why you might want to do that, just in case that's not a concept you're familiar with. And then finally, there's these master effects. So that's when everything gets added together in here, it gets sent out into these master effects and the whole sound goes through those effects. So you might want to put some compression on there or, you know, a final EQ, or maybe even want to put a chorus on everything. That is where you would do that. So let's just, I suppose, mess around with these effects sections and get an idea for them because there's a couple of other things I need to show you as well. I'm just going to play like a chord progression here in the background. And we're just going to sort of turn that into more of a pad sort of a sound. So, and we're not going to use any of the synthesizer. We're just going to use the effects just so we can see. So the first thing, uh, let's just stick with scene A for now. And let's add, say, a chorus to it. So now if I go to scene B here, that chorus is not applied. It's just the straight saw wave. And then let's go in and also add to scene a perhaps some sort of a filter. So let's see if we can get something here in air windows that might work for us. So we've got this capacitor filter here from air windows. So I'm just going to filter out some of the high end. And of course, if we go back to scene B, it's still default. So let's say that we're happy with that. Let's maybe put it an octave up. Uh, let's put oscillator one an octave up. All right, and now let's move on to scene B and let's, let's then mix them together. So let's put say this ensemble or maybe a rotary speaker might be cooler. So let's go for rotary speaker here and let's go for a uh, rotor chorus. So that's getting pretty loud. Let's turn down scene B. And that definitely needs a filter. So let's bring in that air windows filter. Maybe let's use a different one. So let's use hombre here. So we're getting sort of a phased out sound there. So that's scene B, and there's scene A. They probably sound terrible together, but... Yeah, they do. Let's change up, uh, just to make it a bit more passable, let's just change up the amp envelope here on both of them. And maybe let's put something extra here on scene B. Let's put an ensemble. Uh, let's go for monster dirt. That'll do. So let's just say that that sounds good. It, it sounds terrible. But uh, that's just an example of how you can put individual effects on them. So scene A sounds like this. Scene B sounds like this. Pretty weird. Uh, so yeah, then let's mix them together. Okay, so now we've got this sort of weird sound. Let's say we wanted to add a reverb to it, but we don't necessarily want a different reverb on scene A and scene B. It would be a waste of an effect slot and we probably want them to be the same anyway. So we just have to set up the same setting twice. So let's um, into this first slot here, let's insert a reverb. So let's go for air windows, um, so there's a bunch of effects. The way these are laid out is you've got filtering, distortion, mangling, modulation, time and space. These are all the surge effects. And, you know, you can go through them here and select the presets. So as the arrow comes out, it's giving you basically presets. 
And then also um, you've got these multi effects and this is where you can go in to say air windows and it has its own suite of effects that are sort of completely separate. You've got conditioner, mid side tool. I'm not gonna go into detail on all these, it would take all day, but, but just so you're sort of aware of the, the way that this is all organized. You can also clear chains. So you can see here, you can clear send effects chain. You can clear the global effects chain, which is this master effects here at the end. You can clear scene A or scene B that would clear out these. Uh, you can also refresh the uh, effects preset lists if more have been added and they're not showing up. Or you can copy an effects preset and paste it somewhere else. So that is, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically how this sort of effects browser thing works. So let's go back to what we were doing and let's say we want to put a reverb on this sound. So I'm going to go for an air windows ambience and I'm going to go for this chamber here. So let's just focus on one sound. So let's go back to single and just listen to A and let's send A to this send effect here, this air windows reverb. Pull down the volume. So let's make it wetter and darker and lighter and longer. So that's the sound of our reverb here. And let's bring B, let's listen to B, and let's send that through as well. Let's up the volume on B a bit. So there's B going through as well. And now let's mix them together. And now let's say, uh, that's maybe not the best reverb set never, but it doesn't really matter. Let's say we wanted to put them through a delay as well. So let's say we want to put them through a ping pong 16th um, preset here. So now we've got that. Now we can send to effects two, or just to be difficult, let's put it on effects three here. And then if we're in sort of our default position, we're not gonna see it. So we've got to select it here so that three and four come up. Let's just hear B by itself and send that to effects three here, the delay. And then let's send A to it as well. And then just to be fun, let's also add a phaser. And uh, let's just select one of the presets. Let's go with aliens, it's probably crazy, but. And now let's send effect A to that. And now let's send B to the phaser, which is effect four here on the send. And then let's hear them together. Okay, so we've got kind of a weird sound there. Now let's say that we wanted to EQ the whole lot. That's where our master effects will come in. So we can come in here to our master effects and say, um, let's go for just this graphic EQ here. Let's initialize it. Sorry, I wanna go for the graphic EQ initialized. And let's just start messing around with these frequencies, maybe pull out some. So let's pull out 120 a bit. Let's make it a bit more airy. So let's pull out a lot of these low mids. Maybe we want to get rid of 30 hertz altogether. Just clean it up a bit. Maybe we want to bring out the airiness a bit more. So we want to say boost, you know, everything above 8K. And this is applied to everything. So, so this will apply to our reverb tail and all of that will go through here. So now let's say that we, you know, don't like that phaser anymore. We can double click it or right click it and that will disable it. Let's say we don't like this rotary on B, let's double click it, get rid of it. Okay, maybe we missed the phaser. So we can double click it again, and then the phaser is back and the sends are where they were. So when we double click it, we're deactivating it, we're not deleting it, we're not removing it, so we can always come back to it. Okay. 
And that is pretty much it for the effect section. Again, every effect is going to have its own controls. Some of them are really obvious, like the EQ, and some of the air windows effects have, you know, bigness and brightness and coolness and you know, you kind of just have to play with them to see what they are. But there's a whole host of stuff in here and you can route them pretty much whatever way you want. So that is the effects section. Okay, so the final section we're going to look at here is the modulation section. This section allows us to modulate all the other parameters of the synth over time um, and in different cool and interesting ways. So let's start with how to assign a modulation and also um you know let's start with this macro which is the simplest form so this basically allows us to modulate various things at once control say you know maybe your pitch and your shape with one slider so there's a couple of ways to attach a modulation you can come in and right click on what you want to modulate and then you can go add modulation from and we could go macro one and then we could type in 12 semitones and then we'd have an octave of modulation here one slider and then with our macro the other thing we can do is we can attach it to other stuff so let's say we also wanted to mess with the shape parameter here so another way that we can attach modulation is we can simply take our modulator that we want in this case pitch and we can drag it onto what we want to modulate and then type in say 12 percent so now we're modulating both of those but the easiest way and the most effective way is to click on it until it turns green. And then we can simply visually slide all of our modulations to where we want them. So let's say we want sync up here. Let's say we want to sync that much. Now we've got that. And the advantage to this is we can control a bunch of stuff. So we could say, you know, change the width here. Or we could change, I don't know, the unison amount, the detune amount. Let's turn on unison voices. And now, it's pretty loud, so let's turn that down. Now this macro is controlling all of those things at once. Let's say we wanted to rename it. We could also rename the macro and call it, I don't know, cool. So now we've got our cool macro. That does everything here. There's a couple more things we can do if we right click on it. So we can turn it into bipolar mode. And this will basically set our current uh, modulation. So, so basically, if our pitch is here, it sets that as the center point. And then we can go plus and minus that. Whereas in non bipolar mode or unipolar mode, we can only go up. The other thing we can do if we right click in here is let's say we're not in love with this unison modulation. We can come in here and we could either mute it, which means we're not deleting it. We're just we're just turn it off just to see what it sounds like. So maybe we decided after all that actually the unison made the sound. So let's unmute it. And now we think that sounds way better. Or let's say maybe we don't want to hear any of the modulation. So let's. Uh, come down to these apply to all so this will actually allow us to mute all the modulation now this will do nothing we'll just stay where it currently is and now we can unmute all which is here then we hear them all again let's say we wanted to get rid of this width we can also hit this x and that will allow us to basically get rid of that modulation and we could also get rid of them all if we wanted to down here with this apply to all the other thing is the pencil. So say we wanted to change the pitch from 12 semitones to 24. It's out of the range. So we would have to extend the range of our pitch slider here. So let's go back and do that again. And let's edit our, yeah. So let's change this to 24 semitones. And yeah, that's um, that's basically everything that you would want to know within the context menus. We have those for each of the modulators. So we could rename our LFO as well to cool LFO. And you know, if we had this attached to a bunch of stuff like I just showed you, we can come in here and do all the same stuff. So we can, you know, knock some of them off or mute some of them. 
So the exact same thing is available for each modulator. Okay, so let's move on to some of the other stuff available in this modulator section besides the macros. Um, so we're going to skip these LFO and SLFO modulators just for a second because these are sort of the main modulators and there's quite a bit of depth to them. So we'll go over some of the simpler ones first. So we'll start here with Velocity. Um, velocity is available here via this control. We can send Velocity to the amp or the volume of the synth. Um, but this will allow us to attach velocity to other parameters. So let's say I wanted the pitch to change as I hit the key harder, I might do a velocity control to that. Let's make it more drastic. So now the harder I hit the key, the more the pitch will go up. Or maybe I'd want to attach it to the sync as well. So I'm hitting the same key here. Very simple, so you can attach velocity to whatever you would like to. Then we have release velocity. This is the release velocity. So basically you can attach this also to whatever you might want to. So basically all these modulators on the top here basically are covering stuff that you can do with your keyboard controller. So this next one here, Poly Aftertouch, if your keyboard has polyphonic aftertouch available, this will allow you to control uh, different parameters with poly aftertouch. The difference between poly aftertouch and channel aftertouch is that if you've got a keyboard with aftertouch, um, basically it just sends out one signal. And if you've got poly aftertouch, that's going to send out one signal per note. So you can have different amount of aftertouch for each note that you're holding down. So for instance, my keyboard doesn't have poly aftertouch, so I would have to use this channel aftertouch. And I could say attach that to maybe the sync here. And then as I push down on my aftertouch, the sync will go up. And of course, if I had poly aftertouch, I would be able to do that with multiple notes and have each of them move independently. Next, we've got pitch bend. So obviously your pitch bend is attached to the pitch, so you can bend the pitch. And as we've seen, you can control that up here. But let's say you wanted other stuff to happen when you use the, the pitch bend. Maybe you want to, let's set this to a square wave here. Maybe as we bend the pitch, we want the pulse width to change. We could attach our pitch bend wheel also to pulse width. And then obviously mod wheel as well, very simple. Let's say we had a filter here. Let's go for one of these low passes and let's pull it down and attach our mod wheel to it. Then we can use our keyboard's mod wheel to control that. Then we have breadth CC information here as well. So if you wanna send this out to anywhere in the synth, you can as well. Also, if you have an expression pedal attached to your controller, you can map that in here using this expression. Your sustain pedal here can also be mapped to whatever you'd like to map it to in the synth. You may want to map it to release or, you know, you can map it to whatever you want. And then also we've got MPE timbre here. So this is going to allow you to control parameters per note if you have an MPE controller. I'm not going to go too much into, into these ones because to be honest with you, if you're using these with your controller, you probably just need to reference your controller manual to see how to best set this up with the synth. But once you've got your controller set up to use any of these things, you can easily map them within the synth using these. So next we have our filter envelope generator. This allows us basically to map our filter envelope here that you can see we used earlier to anything we want. So let's say we have it set up like this. Go into filter one and maybe we want it also to control the sync and the shape here. We can do that. Same with the amp envelope. So these are basically just allowing us to use these envelopes to control other parameters. We could map, map this to say, I don't know, pitch or something like that. Okay, so next we have random here. This is going to give us a random value each time we strike a new key. So let's say maybe we want to attach this to the sync here. Um, every time we hit a key, we're going to get a different random sync value. And also, I just want to draw your attention to these three lines here. So these are actually separate outputs for this random modulator. 
So we've got this random bipolar uniform, that's our first output, but we can actually use these other, so we've got random bipolar normal, and then we have random unipolar uniform, and random unipolar half normal. These are just different types of randomness, basically. Um, and we can actually use these as separate outputs. So I can have this one connected to something, but I can also have this random unipolar uniform connected to, say, the filter here. And these operate independently of each other. So this is still operating on the sink, and then this separate output is operating on the cutoff. So next we have this alternate modulator here, and this is going to alternate between the minimum and maximum value that we set. So if I apply this to say the pitch over here, it's going to be at this value, and then the next time I hit the note, it's gonna be at this minimum value. And also, um, we have a separate output for this. We also have a unipolar version. So bipolar is going to give us the maximum up here above the center frequency, and then it's going to give us the maximum below the center frequency here. And unipolar is just going to hit our center frequency and above, and it's going to alternate between those. So let's uh, unlink the first output here. And remember, these are separate outputs, so I have to select this one. And then I have to unlink it from this. And then I'm going to select this second one, and I'm going to actually link this one. So you can see it's actually a separate modulator. And now this one is just going to see how it's already modulated differently. This one is going to go between the center value and the top value here. So then the next one we have here is key track. Key track will simply allow us to take a parameter, let's say sync, and attach it to the keyboard. So as I play up in range in the keyboard, um, basically it's going to increase the sync value. So you can sort of hear that here. So you can see as I'm getting higher, we're getting much more of that sync effect. And then we've got a couple of sort of variations of this. They're sort of just more specific versions of it. So for instance, lowest key here, basically what it's going to do is it's going to set the modulation value of what I'm controlling to whatever the lowest key I'm holding is. So if I'm holding, say, this note, you can hear where the filter is. And then as I go up, you can hear that that value isn't changing. But if I hold a higher note, and I start going down, you can hear the lower that I get, the lower that filter cutoff is. And as soon as I approach the note and go above it, the position of the filter remains the same. Uh, highest note is the exact same concept, but the other way around. So in, this time, instead of it only being the lowest note that's going to change the value, it's the higher, highest note. So if I start really low here, you can hear as I go up, this filter is going to open up. And as I go down, it's going to close back off again. And then latest key basically just means whatever key that I hit last, regardless of whether it's high or low, is going to be the one that decides where my modulation is. And that's basically it for the modulators that we have, apart from these main ones, which we're gonna go into now. Okay, so our sort of main modulators here are these ones, LFO1 through LFO6, and then we've got SLFO1 through SLFO6. So what's the difference, first of all, between an SLFO or, and by the way, these can be changed to anything. So by default, they're an LFO, but we can also change this to a step sequencer, and you can see it's renamed sequence one there, or we can change it to, you know, a formula, or we can change it to, say, a multi-segment envelope. So for now, let's just leave them all on LFOs, and these can be independently changed, so I could have this one be LFO, and number two could be, say, a step sequencer, and number three could be an envelope, and number four could maybe also be an envelope, and then five could be, say, you know, our MSEG, and then this last one here could be a formula. So you can have them be basically whatever you want them to be. And these SLFOs are the same. So you have the exact same options that you can set up for them. So you can have them all be different if you want them to be. So what is the difference between a regular LFO up here or a scene LFO or a scene envelope? So you can see when you click in here, this one is called a scene LFO. 
and this one is called a voice LFO. So the difference between them is that this LFO is per voice. So every note that I hit basically gets its own LFO. So if I attach this to say the cutoff, that's one note. But if I play multiple notes, they're all going to start off their LFO at the point that I hit them. So you'll hear the LFOs are kind of moving differently to each other. Right, so that's what a voice LFO is. Now let's apply that same modulation to a scene LFO so that we can see the difference. So there are definitely use cases for both of these. So let's use the scene LFO, and now I'm gonna hit a bunch of different notes. Right, so now you can see all the LFOs are synced up. So basically this LFO is basically an LFO for the whole scene. And then the the normal LFO, the non-scene LFO, uh, this one is for each note. So now let's dig into one of these LFOs and see, you know, what can we actually do with it? So first of all, um, we have all these options here, which we'll come to in a second, but you can actually load up presets. So you can see there's a bunch of different envelope presets here. LFO presets, uh, multi-segment presets, there's a whole load of those, so let's load one of those up and see what it looks like. So there's all these different presets in here, and it's worth messing around with these to see, you know, if you can find something cool or useful in there. Um, we have presets even for the step sequencer, so there's a bunch of different stuff that you can find in here. And also, if you set something up in here that you like, say, you know, you change this around and you mess about with those and you do a bunch of stuff here and you're like, oh, that sounds awesome. And you can also save your own presets by hitting the save up here and it will let you uh, name the preset and all of that stuff. Okay, so let's start having a look at the actual stuff in here. So first of all, let's look at these first few choices that we have together. So we have a sine LFO here, then we have a triangle LFO, a square LFO, then we have a saw LFO or ramp LFO, and then we have these sort of more random ones. So we've got this like random glide LFO. So you can see it has random values in there, um, but it glides between them. And then we have a random stepped LFO. So this is going straight from one value to another. And these, for all intents and purposes, are the exact same. They're just different shapes, but they have all the same settings. So within, say, our sine LFO here, we can increase or decrease the rate. So let's just attach it to something so we can hear how this sounds. And let's turn on the filter here. Let's go for a low pass 24. So you can hear that LFO is going there. Now we can increase the rate. We can go pretty fast. We can go up to 512 hertz. We can also, if we want, we can right click on this and we can actually tempo sync it. So now I can set it to, um, say, if I want to set it to an eighth note, I can set it up here. That would be an exact eighth note now. We can also set the phase, which is, you can see what's happening here. By default, it's going to start sort of at the zero crossing of the LFO. Let's tone it down so we can see that a little bit better. So it's going to start at the zero point here and then it's going to go up and down. We can change the phase and sort of set where we want it to start. This really is only massively applicable to key trigger, um, and I'll go into what this is in a second. Then we can deform. So deform is just going to let us slightly skew the shape of the oscillator. So it sort of widens out. Or if we go this way, we're sort of thinning out the sine wave. So in that respect, we can get a lot of different shapes. And then we also have amplitude, so we can turn the actual LFO itself up or down. So you can see when I bring it down there, it's having less of an impact. And it's worth noting with this deform parameter here, there are multiple different types. So we've got type one at the moment. Let's see what type two looks like. So completely different shape change there. It's almost like a, an FM sort of effect. And then we get the inverse as well. And then we've got type three here as well. So slightly different type of a deform there as well. And these are going to do different things on the different oscillators. So let's have a look at what it does to a triangle wave. And then our types here as well. Still the same idea, but obviously our base wave is different. So the result is going to be a bit different. Then we could change it to our square wave here. 
and the square wave hasn't got multiple deform types all it has is this one deform type and that's going to change the pulse width so you can bring it right down to zero and then we've got our saw or ramp here and this has a different deform so similar enough to the sine wave again just our starting point is different and we also have those almost sort of fm shapes that we can impart on it and then on our random oscillator or random glide oscillator here the deform it's going to let us sort of have a bit of control over that randomness and then with this sort of sample and hold lfo it actually will let us sort of glide between as well so we can make it more similar to this one we can also change the shape in this direction and it's going to sort of sharpen it and create more of a sawtooth kind of a shape um, another thing to note about the LFOs is that they have their own envelope. So this will allow us to say bring in the envelope over time with this attack parameter. So you can see it's sort of fading in there. We could even delay it so that say we take this out so that it doesn't happen for the first say second. And then it will come in. We can also tempo sync this. So let's say that we wanted it to come in after the first eighth note or the first quarter note. So it's going to give us a quarter note with no modulation. And then it will start to modulate. We could even say fade it in with this attack. So it won't do anything at all. And then it will begin to fade in. And then we have a sustain here. So this will allow us to bring it back down to zero. And then our decay will decide how long the LFO effect is going to last. So you can see there's no effect for the first quarter note, then it begins to rise up and it will hit its peak and then it will start to fade back down again until it hits zero. And if we wanted to stay at that peak level for a certain amount of time, we use the hold parameter. So that will allow us to hold it for a certain amount of time before it starts to decay. And we can also tempo sync this. So we can tempo sync everything within here so we can have our LFO come in and out as we want and it will all be synced to the grid. So the only other things really to be aware of in the LFO is we also have these options, free run, key trigger, random, and this unipolar one as well, which is kind of separate. Basically, key trigger means that every time we hit a key, the, the LFO is going to start here at the beginning. The LFO is going to start here at the beginning and then basically just keep modulating until we hit another key, then it will restart. Free run basically means that the LFO will just keep running in the background, tempo synced, and then whenever we hit a note, it just kind of comes in wherever it comes in. So it could be here, it could be here, it could be wherever, wherever the LFO is at the moment. So it's not restarting every time. And then random means every time we hit a key, it's going to bring us in at a random point in the LFO. And then unipolar here, what this means is... Basically, by default, it's in bipolar, which means that when I modulate something, it's going to go above and below the center frequency. If I hit unipolar here, it's only going to go above, and you can see that reflected here as well. So that's kind of us done with the LFOs. Uh, the next option that we have within these modulators is an envelope. And this is extremely similar to the other envelopes we've looked at before. But basically, I've got this currently attached to our cutoff here. And right now, it's pretty much just set to be on and off. But I could say bring in my cutoff over time by increasing the attack. Again, I'm not going to give a full envelope tutorial here. I have done that in other videos, um, but we'll just go through the basics of it. So attack is going to bring it in over time. And then our sustain sets the level it goes down to. So basically, I'm going to set it to zero. And then the decay here is basically going to dictate how long it takes for us to go from our maximum value here back down to the sustain level, which is currently set to zero. And then we have the same options that we had within the LFO here, um, but now we're just applying them directly to the signal. So we can also hold at that maximum value for a certain period of time, and we can also delay the signal for a certain amount of time. And these can all be tempo synced as well. So you've got a lot of flexibility with this envelope. We've also got release here as well, and release basically 
is um, how long it takes it to decay back to zero after you've let go of the key. So this also has a couple of controls here. It doesn't have a rate or a phase because they don't really apply to an envelope. But um, you can also deform this, which will allow you to sort of change the curvature of the envelope. So you've got a lot of options there for shaping your envelopes. So the next one we have here is our step sequencer. And this is basically the same as the sample and hold random LFO that we looked at earlier, except this time we get to draw the steps in. So I can draw in a bunch of random stuff in here. And we can do other things. So basically, we've we've drawn the shape now, and then we've got these uh, little buttons here, which will allow us to nudge it one step forward or one step back. So we can sort of move the modulation we've drawn. And we've got a lot of controls that are going to seem familiar here from the LFOs. We can change the rate. And this can also be tempo synced, just like the LFOs. We can also shuffle it. So you can see that what it's doing is it's slightly offsetting the steps from the grid. And then we've also got the deform control, which is going to sort of smooth it out on this end and make it sort of more similar to this LFO that we looked at earlier. And then on this end, it's going to sort of turn it into more ramp shapes. So you could even have them all set to maximum, and then you'd basically have this sort of a ramp LFO shape. You can really tighten those up as well. Then we've got our amplitude, which is the exact same as what we had on our LFOs. We also have the option to apply an envelope over this, like we did with the LFOs, so we could bring this shape in over time and have it fade out. Another thing that we can do in here is we can sort of set up little loop points. So let's say that I wanted to loop, let's say I wanted to create like a little rhythmatic sequence. So I'll tighten these up so they're sort of saw, more saw-like, and then I'll create this rhythmatic sequence with these three. Then I can pull this handle back, and you can see what that's actually doing is it's looping these three steps over and over again, so you can see how they're looped here. And I could maybe change the length of that, maybe I want to bring in this fourth step. And of course, you can fade that in with the envelope or whatever you'd like to do. Um, so there's a lot of options with this step sequencer LFO. And then the final one we're going to talk about in a lot of detail is this multi-segment envelope here. I am going to go into this formula modulator a little bit, but we're not going to go in depth. It's kind of beyond the scope of this video, but uh, I will show you where you can get started with this one. Um, but this multi-segment one basically gives you the freedom to draw whatever sort of shape you want. So, you know, we can draw different points in here and we can basically create whatever shape we would like to create. There are a couple of things to note about this. So first of all, I'm going to start over here with the movement mode. This sort of um, the, this sort of controls how the editing of this multi-segment envelope behaves. So in single mode, you can see I can move this point sort of freely between these two other points and it doesn't really affect anything else. When I go into this shift mode here, it's actually going to move all of the points after it. They're going to stay in the same place in relation to each other, but they're going to move forward however much I move this point. So there may be certain times when you would want to use that. Then there's this draw mode. And basically what this draw mode does is if I come in here and click around and create a bunch of points, I'm double clicking by the way to create points here. And I'm also, you're able to zoom by holding control in my case. You can sort of zoom around and you can also zoom in and out using the mouse wheel. But if I draw in a bunch of points in here and then I'm in the straw mode, I can kind of hold down my mouse and it will sort of just allow me to draw those points without kind of selecting them and dragging them around. I'm just sort of moving them freely with my mouse. Then we have a couple of different modes here. So we've got edit mode, envelope, and LFO. And basically this allows us to edit the multi-segment envelope as if it were an envelope or an LFO. You can see it actually has, in this envelope mode, it has a uh, basically a sustain point here. So if I were to attach this to something. So now I've got it attached to the cutoff. 
Um, you can sort of see what it's doing here, but basically what it does in this envelope mode is it's gonna play through this initial part. And then once it's done with that, it's basically going to loop this sustain section here. So you can see as I bring the rate up, this sustain section, which is relatively flat, is just sort of kept in place here until I let go of the key. And if I'm to edit something in this, you can now see that my sustain section here, the point that's being looped, is just this part over and over again, and I can make as many changes to that as I want. In this LFO mode, basically what we're doing is we are looping this entire shape as if it were an LFO. So let's, uh, back in the draw mode, let's draw this into sort of a more LFOE kind of shape. Uh, that'll probably do. Obviously, we could do a much better job than that, but it doesn't really matter. So if I bring the rate down here, you can see that basically as I go up, it's just going to loop this as if it were an LFO. We can make any changes we want in here. And get like a crazy looping shape. Also, if we're in this envelope mode, we can also turn the loop off. So basically what it will do is it will just run through this once and then finish. And then it sort of flatlines. And if you are looping stuff in here, you sort of have the control of what points you want it to move between as well. So if I wanted to loop this section, I could, or if I only wanted to loop a very small section over and over again, I can select that from within here. Also, when we're messing with these points, they will by default snap to the grid. So you can see that they are snapping in sort of very tight intervals here. And we can control the resolution of this snapping here. So you can see by default, we have uh, sort of 16 steps of vertical snap, which you can see drawn in here. And it will snap towards those lines. And you can have sort of up to a hundred lines of snapping, both on the horizontal and the vertical axis. You can also turn off snapping altogether if you'd like, and then you can just basically freely move these points around however you might want. So there's also a lot of actions that we can perform on different parts of this MSEG. So we can um, do actions like, for instance, there's a bunch in here, I'm not going to go through them all, but you could say flip it vertically and that will sort of flip it upside down and mirror it on itself. You can create eight sawtooth plucks and that will just literally draw one in for you that you can edit. There's a bunch of those that you can create. So we could do 128 sign lines. And then if we zoom way in here, you can see that this is a sine wave made out of 128 points and we can manipulate that however we might want to. There's also different curve options here. So if I've got this really simple shape here and we click, we can go to, right now it's a linear curve. We could have an S curve. So you can see here, now we've got an S curve. We could also have a Bezier curve or we could have a hold curve. We can also do other stuff. Like for instance, we could have uh, a sine wave curve and this will actually let us put sine waves in between two points. And you can actually put these up to really high frequencies as well, if that's something that you need to do. And you could have, say, a triangle or a saw shape or square shape in between. And then there's some other unusual ones like bump here, which is sort of like uh, like an EQ point or something like that. There's this stairs one as well, which allows you to have stairs in between two points. Smooth stairs, which is just a smoother version of that. And a... And also Brownian bridge, which is a sort of weird stair shape as well. The possibilities of how you can shape the multi-segment envelope are absolutely endless. I could go into absolutely every detail of everything in here, but it's best to just explore and play around with it. You can pretty much create any shape that you want to in here. You can also impart an envelope onto this. You can delay it just like we could with all of the other LFOs. And again, just like the other LFOs, we can have this be unipolar or bipolar, and we can set up our key trigger or our free run, whatever suits for the sound that you're making. Now, the next one that I'm going to talk about is this formula modulator. I'm not going to go into detail on how to create things in this. That would make this video extremely long. Maybe I'll go into it in future, um, but I will tell you how to get started with it. First of all, what this is, is this... I suppose just basically allows you to program your own modulator. So you can program whatever shape you want in here by writing in, I believe it's Lua is the scripting language that they're using. Um, so this is a multiple output modulator. So you can see that you can actually set up eight different outputs from this one modulator. 
And uh, just how you get started with this, if you want to mess around with it, is there are some tutorial presets in here for the formula modulator where you can click in and it will have little formulas written. So you can see it's written a formula here and there are notes which explain to you sort of what things are doing and how it's all set up. Now, the final thing that we're going to look at here in this modulator section is this sort of a list modulation list that we can do. Um, this is really cool because it's just a way of organizing our modulations. It basically acts as a big modulation matrix. So let's say we had LFO1 attached to a bunch of stuff and then we had LFO2 attached to a bunch of other stuff. It doesn't really matter what it sounds like. We're just showing for the sake of it. And then LFO3, we attached to maybe some of the same stuff and some different stuff. So now we've got a bunch of modulations happening. Those all show up in here and we can edit them so we can change the amount. Let's say we wanted our LFO1 oscillator shape one amount to increase. We can increase it in here. We can also mute it in here. We can delete it if we want to. And it's also just a good way of organizing all of our different modulations. So right now it's organized by source. So you can see everything LFO1 is modulating, everything LFO2 is modulating, and they're all listed underneath. We can also, mod we can also select target. So say if I had a bunch of stuff modulating oscillator one pitch, so let's just modulate oscillator one pitch with everything. So I'm just gonna use all six of the LFOs. You can now see when I come into this list, under oscillator one pitch, we can see all of the LFOs are modulating it. And we could change the amounts that it's going to, or we could mute them, or we could even delete them from here. Um, also, if we have an awful lot of modulations going on, we can filter. So let's say we only wanted to see what's modulating the cutoff. We can see now that LFO3 is modulating the cutoff, and we could change that if we wanted to. So a great way of organizing everything in here. We can also um, add modulation from in here. So we can select a source, say we wanted to modulate, use the macro one to modulate, let's say the oscillator one level. We can now add that, let's clear our filters here. And now let's search for that modulation that we did. So we used our, we used our macro one. So we can search here by source macro one, and there's the modulation that we just added. And then we can change that from within here as well. And the other thing that we can change in here is we can see what's being displayed. So by default, it's shown us the depth and the values and the ranges. We can simplify that so that we literally just see this uh, slider here, or we can just see the depths, or we can see values and depths, or we can see everything here. So just a nice way of organizing your modulators and quickly getting to them, you know, being able to filter them quickly, being able to quickly mute things, try them out, quickly change a lot of values at once in different modulations without having to click between them. And of course, easily remove things that you do not want anymore. So the last thing to touch on here is just the menu. The menu will allow you to change things like the zoom level or say, you know, you can change from this classic skin here to the dark skin or whatever you might want. You can also browse for skins through the skin library. As this is open source, it will also give you access to the code. Uh, you can access the manual or the website, um, contact the developers, find additional preset content, change your mouse behavior. So if you want it to be faster or slower, um, you can set it up for touchscreen mode. You can set up patch defaults different workflow things for uh, changing uh, basically key bindings and stuff. And you can access your tune and editor and all that from here. So yeah, there's a bunch of, of, of different stuff in the menu. Um, it's all fairly self-explanatory. I do encourage you to go and read the manual if there's anything that you feel I didn't cover in too much detail. It's all very well covered within the manual. But I think as far as the synthesizer and effects and modulators go, this video should be fairly comprehensive in terms of getting you using all that stuff. Um, I just want to give a big thank you to my patrons who support the channel. Um, they really do help a lot for me to be able to put some time into these videos. Um, if you want to become a patron, you can go and check out my patron. Um, I put like wavetables up there, um, Bitwig project files, and also probably in about a week from this video, maybe a little bit less, I will be making an entire track with Surge. So there'll be probably 20, 30 presets. And I'm going to, it's probably going to be about as long as this video where I go through all of those presets in Surge 
And instead of just showing you what things do, really show you more the context that you would use them in. I'll be doing that on the channel as well for free, but um, I do have a big video planned over there for my patrons as well. So big thank you to them. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you learned a lot. Um, please do leave a like if you enjoyed it. It took a lot of effort to put this video together. And uh, yeah, leave a comment if there's anything you want to know or even just let me know that you found it helpful because it does help to know that people are actually finding these videos helpful. Thank you very much.